the Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92 000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and Palace Capital Proprietary Limited, ACN 616 130 913, AFSL CAR 1257 625 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice, how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Palace Capital is a leading financier and investment manager specialising in real estate debt. Offering tailored solutions through actively managed funds, it caters to investors seeking dependable income and monthly liquidity, with a total transaction value exceeding $5.3 billion and an unblemished track record of zero principal losses, Palace Capital delivers attractive risk-adjusted returns. The Palace Senior Income Fund offers monthly liquidity and asset-backed income, rated four stars by SQM Research. Partner with Palace to access tailored investment solutions. Hello, my name is Andrew Rocks and welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Podcast. Today I'm live in uh, Victoria. In fact, we're literally looking out and we can see the MCG out of Adam's beautiful offices. And I'm here today with Adam Morse, who's the Managing Director of Quarter 5 Family Wealth. G'day, Adam. How are you? Hi, Roxy. I'm great. Thanks for having me. And uh, for all the, the listeners out there um, who think they've got a pimping office, um, I'm not saying that this could have been um, the host of, of, of a white party, but um, it does have, quite honestly, one of the most magnificent setups that I've seen for a financial uh, planning business. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'm sure the story of how we come to, to be in this building will be part of the fabric of this interview. Absolutely. We're in, uh, we're in gate eight, which is the eighth gate of the MCG. Not literally, but we're looking at it and we're in a, in a, in a far beautiful um, or a very beautiful um, part of the world. So Adam, I, uh, I asked just five minutes ago and I said, oh, what degree did you do? And, and you actually said, I wanted to be a financial planner from the age of 16. I just don't get that normally. So maybe flesh that out and tell us, give me a bit of an idea of that statement parlaying into what you chose to do. I'll start off with a quick shout out to a fellow fellow financial advisor, Scott Nilsson, um, who um, I met at the age of 16. Um, he, was, uh, he was over at our place and um, I was asking him a couple of questions around what he was up to and he was studying financial planning at RMIT back then. It was in his year of placement and I got in really interested in the concept of it, which I'm extremely thankful for sort of thinking back to that age because when you I really feel for kids who are 16, 17 trying to work out what to do with the rest of their life in inverted commas. Fortnite? Yeah. From what, oh, I had Sonic the Hedgehog back then. There you go. You go close. Um, so, yeah, um, I, the concept of helping people, problem solving, I've, I was always pretty good with numbers. Um, I had a mum that had, you know, or have a mum who's got a great care for other people and a dad who's got a really strong work ethic. What did your parents do? Uh, Dad's always been an earth mover, um, and then Mum worked as a uh, as a secretary within the ANSET until having kids, and um, and then uh, from there she's done she's worked with disability support workers. Oh wow! Um, after we got to the an, an, an age where she could sort of go back out and get involved. So I'm looking at your timeline, and um, looks like you kicked off or finished school around 2000 2001. It, everyone knows when ANSET pulled the pen because mm. um, it coincided with a pretty horrific time. So fundamentally. Your, your mum had that career and then the moment you started your career, 
yeah, answer it finished and she parlayed into more of a sort of a health and caring thing. Is that right? Uh, no, she sort of departed answer earlier than that because um, just when, when she had young kids. So it's, um, we, and look, we had, um, we had, you know, like a lot of families, we uh, had a split, uh, split parents. So um, that meant that we were sort of bouncing, bouncing between the two a little bit. And uh, it wasn't the you know the conventional uh, upbringing of uh, sort of two parents and three kids, but um, it it taught us a lot of a lot of great skills in life, you know, resilience, as I said, work ethic, and and care for people, and that that were that were the things that really um, sort of resonated for me when I thought about what financial planning sounded like it was all about. Looking after people, it's funny. My uh, my own upbringing very similar. My dad was in um, aviation, aircraft mechanic, so not quite earth moving, but. Um uh, you know, I had lots of exposure to um, uh, big machines and a lot of detail and whatnot, and it basically very quickly figured out what I wasn't good at. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what you're like at, at driving a bobcat or an excavator, but um, here we are in uh, in private wealth. Yeah, well, uh, funny you say that because uh, that was my uh, job during uni. So uh, driving around and uh, dig- digging holes, and I actually, I actually loved it. But um, something quite cathartic around sort of seeing what you've done. Yeah, absolutely. It's like mowing the lawn. Do you mow lawns yeah. now? I do. I've just handed it over to the seven year old. So uh, he's uh, it's one of his one of his jobs for his pocket money. So, so anyone here from the IHS division of caring, then um, you know, obviously he's very well trained. <laughs> electric electric lawnmower. So there you go. Uh, yeah, take it. Systems but, and processes. Yes. What a theme. Delegation. What a theme. Yeah. So, um, what did you end up doing at, at university? And 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 who like from that background? How, how did you bribe or convince someone to hire you in the from? So I wanted to do financial planning, but then um, I was uh, I was. Uh, consulted out of that, um, and um, sort of the view was that, uh, that look, there's more of a future in you know, software engineering. So uh, instead of applying for RMIT, uh, financial planning at RMIT, I went off and did about six weeks of engineering at Monash, and uh, worked out that um, I had zero passion for that whatsoever. Uh, took the year off, and then next year I went back and studied accounting and economics at Swinburne. So I think doing engineering, you have to go to university five days a week. Doing economics, it's a hard to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, we had, a, we had a good friendship group at uni, and uh, sort of did that for did that for a couple of years, and uh, and then I got to the point where I realised that um, I needed to. I, I was I was the guy that at school um, I get the report to say Adam's got a lot of a lot of potential, uh, but needs to apply himself and do his homework and all the rest of it. And uh, look, part of it was that we um we had you know a uh, a lot of fun as kids and uh, a pretty fluid uh, sort of structure, um, so. That was always a challenge for me, sort of building that discipline into how I function from a day-to-day point of view. It's something I'm very conscious of these days. Uh, but one thing I did, which sort of changed the trajectory for me back then, was switch from uh, the daytime classes to evening classes. So, oh, with all the responsible people, exactly wow. at the front of the class, and and at that point in time, that's where it turned, and I started to really focus in on, uh, you know, tax and the various subjects I was doing, and commercial law, which I really enjoyed. Um, but it was one of the lectures that I was having sort of towards well, in, towards the end of my degree. And uh, I can't remember what subject it was, but it wasn't overly inspiring. So I decided to uh, head out to the computer room, as you do, and um, with the intention of doing some work and ended up on Seek. And I uh, saw a job ad for, uh, for um, McQueen Wealth Management. And I printed it off. I went home very excited. I you know, marked it up with a highlighter. I spoke to my mum about it. I said, look, this sounds absolutely perfect for... Were they Collins Street back then even? St. Kilda Road. Okay. Yeah. So I uh, sort of drove my four-wheel drive in there. And uh, I think it was the first time I'd probably ever been to St. Kilda Road. And I um, caught, up, caught up with Gus. And um, and then a few weeks later, you know, there I was. Yeah, they're a great firm. Um, um, I, I, I have a lot of time for um, that business, so lucky. Um, who's currently running that? Um, and it's uh, it's still going after I think it must be thirty or forty years. I can't remember. But um, so you spent a little bit of time there learning um, about the basis of financial planning. Um, when did you kick off your post grad education? Um, pretty much, I'd say pretty much straight after. So um, post grad education sort of entailed um, because I had done accounting with economic finance, um, so it didn't sort of tick the boxes from a planning point of view. So I did the diploma the advanced diploma, and then the CFP, um, all in all in succession, along with um, you know the estate planning and life risk specialist de- designations as well. So if you had said to me when I was sort of 15 that I'd be sort of doing another um, six or seven or eight years of study post-school by the time you do uni and these other courses, um, I probably would have raised an eyebrow. Um, but it was all, and you know, there was certainly weekends there where you're sort of missing out on going to certain events and all the rest of it. But sort of felt back then that 
these things weren't required, but I've always had a big belief around being as strong as you technically can, particularly as a young advisor, and having these things to really support um, support yourself as a professional. And where did you grow up? What what area? I mean, we're we're talking in in CBD Melbourne now, but we're, whereabouts we um, you spend your formative years? I was out in out in the east. So you know, mum mum was in Ringwood for a long time. Uh, Dad was out uh, in Warrandyte, and um, and then now most of my family live out in the Yarra Valley. Um, so we sort of get out get out that way a little bit. It's a lovely place. It's amazing. It's a lovely place, and um, so like a lot of people I interview, um, y- y- your first um real financial planning group straddled the GFC mm. and you'd been there long enough to probably have a few clients. What did you learn about yourself in the GFC or immediately afterwards? I learned how much resilience I had um, or had the capacity to, to demonstrate because um, I was authorised in, uh, for those that were around back then or look at the share market charts, but was authorised at um, October 2017. Um, so... Um, you know, if you sort of connect the dots on that, it's uh, basically at the very peak of the of the ASX. Um, I'd worked for those first couple of years under a partner of the, of the business, and unfortunately, he got sick uh, early the next year and never returned to the office. And because I'd worked with him and the majority of his clients, I spent uh, basically the next eighteen months meeting meeting a lot of people and talking about you know investment performance and what was happening in the world, which was a real baptism of fire for me. Yeah, I mean, if you just Potentially got on the piss another year at uni. You would have uh, you would have kicked off the year after the GFC, and you would have looked golden. Absolutely for ten years. Uh, it's a sliding door in the home, yeah. Exactly. Or if I finished a year early, maybe I had another year's worth of experience. But uh, it's 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 wonderful. And um, I've also sort of read your background, and you're very passionate about the the MDRT, which came into your world peers probably just after the GFC. Maybe tell us a bit about um why you got involved, um what what it is, and what it's meant to your career, because we sit here today and you, you've, you've um, arguably got a great, a great personal brand. You, you, yourself and your wife have, have built businesses elsewhere, which we're going to get into, and you've got this great high net worth private wealth business. But yeah, maybe tell us the, the MDRT story, please. And prob- look, probably the one um, that's a step before the MDRT, which was sort of coming out of the GFC um, with, uh, with the McQueen team, was, uh, was Bill Backrack. Uh, so, like a lot of businesses post GFC. Um, so, Kieran, we've, we've given you a Bill Baccarat link before, mate. Yep. Can we just click that into Adam's one? Ta. So, um, we were coming out of the GFC, like a lot of, a lot of wealth businesses. It gave us the opportunity to um, reimagine what wealth could be uh, as an advisory model. Um, and during that time, we had someone who's also been a pretty prominent part of my journey, um, Kingsley Oldfield, join McQueen as CEO. Uh, myself and Kings and Gus and Nowaki, um, all sort of all went through a process of thinking through what does the evolution of advice look like going forward. Um, and as part of that, we we went off and did a whole range of different things. But one of them was spending a week with uh, Bill Backrack up in Sydney. We sort of came back from that and we talked about well, what are the things we need to implement into this business to help reshape the advice model um, and goals aligned to values. Um, financial modelling became a big part of it as well actually creating the financial roadmap where we could tangibly lay out for uh, for families and for clients what the future could look like with the different with different sets of assumptions and how we could test different scenarios around that and really get into that strategic advisory role which was the bit that I thought financial planning was going to be all about when I first entered the industry um, so it was a good opportunity to apply that sort of thinking with a group of like-minded people uh, and implement you know, goals-based financial planning, financial modelling, fee-for-service, and then really position ourselves as that, as that strategic advisor. Well, I think in retrospect, financial planning perceivably was all about that. It's just that the actual, this side of the equation, the supply side, hadn't worked out what we're good at or what 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 our clients value. And potentially we spent, um, you know, 20 or 30 years um, being guided down a value proposition that was probably um, a tad conflicted and, and possibly didn't hit all the marks. Yeah, it's a, absolutely. It's a, it's um, I mean, it's how the industry is. It, it was certainly structured, and we're all guilty of just not valuing ourselves highly enough at the, initially. You know, the fact that that um, generally a, a well a well thought out financial model, a roadmap, a, a real genuine peace of mind, even in the absence of recommending a product or an investment, is still a fantastic exercise for for a couple or an individual. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's the really the core of a core of um of what people are looking for, like direction in life and where are they now and what's their capacity to actually achieve the things that they want to achieve in life, and that really helps bring that to life. So they were they were sort of some of the key ingredients that we implemented um, back then. Um, and then it was about two thousand, I think it was two thousand and eleven. Um, Gus said to me, "Oh, look, Morsi, as he'd affectionately call me, I'd uh, I'd really like you to come to to the US with me next year." And um, we we all knew that um, that Gus would head off to the MDRT, but didn't know a lot about it as a, as a business. Um, and that was sort of June each year, right in the middle of end of financial year planning. Um, so you know, thankfully, it's one of the one of the great things that that um, Gus did for for me in my career over the journey. But introducing me to MDRT and the people that are involved. And just the scale of the American MDRT, it was just give us a feel of how bloody big it is. It's unbelievable. Like when you walk into what's called the main platform, which is about 14,000 people from like 80 or different countries. Well, that's every financial planner in Australia. Yeah. Yes, exactly. In one room. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you go in there at sort of 6.30 in the morning and there's live music playing to sort of get everyone up and about, given the early start. But, but I describe it as being half of MDRT is TED Talks meets financial services because you've got speakers that are there that, it is basically on their bucket list to present at MDRT. So you've got them feeling that way about it. Great energy in the room. Um, so half the, half of MDRT is um, is in the main platform. The other half is all these um, breakout sessions, which are typically a thousand uh, thousand plus people. Um, but then you know the real magic happens in and around it. So you know catching up with people for catching up with people for for lunches at, at the bar um, and just. Sharing ideas. I mean, MDRT is all about sharing ideas, which is something that I love doing. It's part of the reason why I'm here today. Um, I'm a big believer that we're all in the, in in the industry together. We lift the industry together. Um, there's more clients than than uh, than we need for all of us to all grow together. Uh, so why not help each other on the journey? And and that really resonated for me as part of MDRT. And I just felt like coming out of that that I'd found this group of people that was all there to help each other, which is which is what I love. So explain to me the the bridge. Then you've gone over and you participated, and very voyeuristically went over and got excited and went, "Well, um, this aligns with my values." What was the bridge for you then, becoming part of it in a serious way in Australia? Uh, well, look, I think just I think just recognizing what it could do. Um, like I, I remember um, Gus and I were you know having a chat at the airport on the way home and um, sort of set a few action items to bring back into the into the practice and started watching MDR TV videos together and and, sh- and we'd do that as a group and share ideas and come up with things that we could implement into the business. Um, then sort of got involved in study groups with MDRT as well. And then as it does, um, I became, you know, sort of some close friends with some people that were involved with the Victorian Committee. Uh, and ultimately, in the year of 2014, which was when we set up Blue Rock Private Wealth, um, I also took on the the uh, the Vic Chair role uh, for two years. So, um, you know, questionable timing just with everything else going on, but it was also, um, you know, it was a great opportunity to to, to um, give give back as part of that group as well. Yeah, and, and um, you know, in this country, it's um, I speak to a lot of people um, who've been involved, and there's, there was the perception was had a bit of a life insurance sort mm. of veneer. Um, maybe give us the elevator pitch of, of where it is today in 2024. Yeah, well, look, I mean, it certainly was born out of the life insurance industry back in the uh, back in the 1930s. But the thing that I guess helps break that down is MDRT is all about the whole person concept, which is how do you operate as a as a professional? Uh, what's the sales function involved in what we do? And client engagement, emotional intelligence, and how we actually in- engage and connect with people and build trust um, is is um, a big part. Of the, of the sales process, um, so whether it's life insurance or whether it's um, whether it's stockbroking or whatever it might be, um, that engagement piece that comes with training around life insurance is transferable into uh, all different disciplines, really. So whilst it does have that life insurance pedigree, this whole person concept, which is about spirituality and, and how you live your personal life, um, super important. And I know we're going, we're talking a bit about sort of how you've got to being where you are today, but I just want to jump in, mm, please. Um, so how do you personally, um, and you did start to intimate, how do you gain trust with um, uh, people? Yeah, it's a good question. I think part of it, I think, is just um, is just genuinely caring about people and how you engage with them and, and how you're interested in them um, and um, looking beyond what you're there uh, to do commercially. Um, so, 
you know, I, I really look for the people that, that are part of our team, but also the people that we look after. Uh, are they people that you just genuinely want to spend time together? So you're trying to work that out as much as what they're trying to work that out in those for, in those first instances. So that's a big big part of it for me, being genuinely interested. And there's a, look, there's another guy who if um, I haven't been as part of his been involved in his courses before, but I'm sure you know there would have pe- people uh, on this podcast would have spoken about Dan Sullivan before. Uh, Dan Sullivan has a rule as part of his process that. Uh, he doesn't speak about himself for the first 23 minutes of a client conversation. I'll uh, stuff that today for you. Uh, well, it's, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here to, here to talk about myself. No, so. No, and look, um, uh, yet again, Kieran, um, the Dan Southern, Southern, God, I'm just going to say Dan's links, <laughs> Dan's links. Um, if we could please uh, get that because we're entering into a, a, an era where for the last five or six years in retail and wholesale advice, a lot of people were paring down the number of clients they had and reducing and scoping their offering and basically learning to be profitable um, as the metrics of valuations change. But but now that has happened, people are back um, looking for clients and they're back sort of, it's almost back to the future. They're going, well, we've got this engine room, which we're going to talk about how you've built engine rooms and where it is today, but I need to be um, uh, that person again and bring in new business. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those skills are, are, are vital. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. and you've just, um, you just instantly... Um, sort of rolled into the fact that you, after doing MDRT, you then um, uh, ran into a group called uh, Blue Rock, which, um, uh, how long were they going? Because you, you kicked off their, um, their financial playing wealth division, is that right? Yeah, so Blue Rock was founded in 2008 as an accounting practice by um, Peter Laylor, who's also been uh, incredibly influential in my career and life. Uh, so a big shout out to Pete. Um, Pete and I live on the same street together and uh, we, we go fishing and camping and hang out as family. So um, Ben, that's that work-life integration piece that I was talking about before. Um, so, so not balanced integration? Yeah. Yeah, I use the word integration because I like the, the, the harmony of those things all um, all interacting together rather than feeling like you need to sacrifice one for the other. And that's not to say that um, you know one is right and the other one is wrong. It's just the way that I uh, apply it to my own life. Uh, to to the uh, maximum degree, um, you know, Ella, my uh, my wife, she was one of the founding accountants of Blue Rock back in two thousand and eight. Uh, so I was uh, I was certainly uh, c- came onto the scene after uh, after it was well and truly her home ground. I have to ask, did she interview you? No, right, go go, no, not not quite. That would have been funny. Yeah, yeah, that would have been a uh, a, a bit of a conflicted process. Well, not at the time, no. but, but potentially afterwards. So, um, and and. Uh, for, for, for listeners who are familiar with Blue Rock, that they, they're accounting, and when you look at their website, it look like they they sort of specialise in particular sorts of um, businesses. What sort of businesses is that? Yeah, so the I and mean, the way that I met Blue Rock was um, I was working with probably four or five different accounting firms as centres of influence, which has always been a big part of how we've grown. Because you believe in two professionals, is that right? The- two trusted advisors. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the two trusted advisor model, particularly when you're working with business owners, yeah. because you need to have a really great handle on what's happening on the business side and then translate that ultimately into what's happening on the personal side. So you kept saying the fact that you were the second trusted business advisor and there was one commonality being this business. And then you just started sniffing, is that right? Um, well, no, it was a little bit different to that. Look, when because I've worked with accountants, um, I think one of the like as a, from a wealth point of view, one of the frustrations that financial planners can often have is trying to sort of open up those accounting relationships and um, get referrals flowing back and forth. And I've sort of put it down through experience to um, accountants from from my point of view, kind of fit into two categories. There's those who are traditional accountants who do the backward-looking tax and compliance, and then there's those accountants who look forward strategically and really open up the conversation for the client holistically. And Blue Rock was the first business that I'd seen do that um, to a really high degree um, and was very much focused on helping business owners on their journey around getting the best out of their business and ultimately how that flows into the personal world. So given all the work we've been doing around values-based financial planning, and financial modelling and all the rest of it, um, then then seeing an accounting firm in action really bringing that to life on the business side, um, and and also then being culturally aligned, that just uh, that just really sort of opened up my eyes to how the two could work together. And look, you, you would have kicked off that business, and you would have been the small partner coming in there, and you you, you developed a niche, and you were there for almost ten years. And during that ten years, it appears that, or well, from an outside looking in, and I, um, it appears that that you started to craft the the wealth business more and more in a direction 
that that had some similarities, but but increasingly um, it, it needed its own its own life and its own heartbeat with with sort of a a link back, but 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 almost separate. Is that is that the reason why quarter five uh, sort of flourished or or sort of evolved? Um, partly, partly. Look, I've always been I've always been focused on evolution, innovation, um, and growth as an advisor. Um, and well, I mean, we built Blue Rock Private Wealth uh, as a you know the leadership team of that business built that for business owners. So um, you touched on it before, but um, Blue Rock's um, Blue Rock is perfectly suited for the entrepreneurial and high net worth um, part of the market, helping on the business side and the personal side. Um, so we built that bit, that Blur of Private Wealth business to about 25 staff, really focused on that holistic advisory trusted advisor model. Um, and just given that search for evolution and growth, I've always seen the pinnacle of wealth in this m- mystical sort of realm of family office as, as wealth advisors. How do we, how do we uh, play in that space? And what does it look like to be an advisor to ultra high net worth families and, and for intergenerational wealth? So it's sort of that thirst for that evolution um, and then having the opportunity to work with some families through their journey. Um, so, you know, and I'm sure we'll touch on this as we go, but our, our, the clients that we work with kind of fit into different categories and, and one of the categories is what we call emerging and emerging is where you've got fast-paced businesses that at some point in time will have an exit um, or they're spinning up a lot of cash and then really need to think about how they set their wealth up beyond themselves because the wealth that they're generating um, is is at that level. So I was had the capacity to go on the journey and then like a lot of things, um, you, you work it out as you go, speak to a lot of people. And then what we essentially started to do was utilize the same fundamentals that we had built within Blue Rock Private Wealth for business owners and then apply those same fundamentals with the additional elements that are required to work with an ultra high net worth family and family office. Now, listening to you for the last um, little while, uh, and I, I go all the way back to the, the qualifications and course that you did, uh, economics and the estate planning, and it was quite a broad, broad brush um, undergraduate that you did. And it's no surprise that you have ended up in, in a, a business that uses the, the real breadth of those skills, whether it be for intergenerational wealth, philanthropy, estate planning, family office, managing conflicts in family offices, which become a big part of the, the value proposition sometimes, being that third person in a, in a meeting. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was the, I suppose, the catalyst. And, and maybe give us a, an idea of quarter five, because I'm, I'm here in your offices uh, today. You've got a great team. Um, you've somehow convinced um, Ella to also be, be part of it. And before I do that, um, what do you do? You've mentioned camping, I think, once or twice already um, uh, today. What, what do you do with your family to, to sort of um, uh, get that work-life integration, but actually the, the family being integrated to it? Yeah, yeah, good question. I think we're still working that out, but we've got a we've got a seven, five, and three year old, um, um, all boys. Um, so they're uh, they're a laugh a minute. I've got three boys, mate, and a year with a yeah. bloke with three boys on it. So um, you've got no idea. Yeah, all right, well, there you go. It's it's all it's all coming for me. Um, yeah, I mean the last the last few years have been been or really you know I think um, we've all been in the same boat from a obviously from a COVID point of view, but having little kids during that period being intensively intensely involved in the business and then sort of in the back end of that still having young kids but spinning out of business there's been a lot going on to um to really sort of focus on getting the foundations of the business right um so I love fishing um so it's sort of my my, my thing outside of outside of uh outside of work and and general family life. Uh, and the footy, getting getting the boys involved in both of those, but also just enjoying um, spending time at home. And uh, and you know, I'm sure you've travelled with young kids, but um, but there's you know, something also about just uh, just not having anything in the diary as well, just getting to spend some spend some good time together or get up the country. The interesting thing about the children your age is that um, in ten years' time, they won't know any you in any other context other than this current business. So even though yeah. your, your career spans all the things we've spoken about. They're only going to remember and have, and boys uh, respond to you showing them and being a role model far more than you telling. Girls will listen to you sometimes. Boys just won't. They just observe by behaviour. So, so it's going to be the the ethical, the work, the the balance um, sort of way in which you and you guys conduct yourselves that they'll remember in their formative years. Mm. Look, and I'm a, I'm a. That's a really good point because I'm a massive believer in, in um, how you are formed during your childhood, and uh, and also how you consciously develop yourself off the back of those experiences. 
one of the guys that I met in MDRT, um, and it was by chance, but probably not by not a, not a coincidence. Was in 2016 when I was in Vancouver. There was a guy who spoke called Tim Sesnick who set up the first multifamily office advisory business in Toronto uh, back in the late 90s. Uh, so I went to his session, and it was amazing. It was like he was talking to me. Um, and then I got invited to a dinner. Was it just a small session of you and him, or was it? No, it was about it was, yeah, exactly. It was, yeah, it felt like it. But, and um, the 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 late and great Tony Bongiorno um, invited me to a dinner that night. Wow. Um, and Tony was a Tony was a great MDRT uh, person as well. And um, and just so it happens that his guest at that dinner uh, it was uh, was Tim Sesnick, and I sat next to Tim, spent two or three hours with him over dinner. And he said, oh, look, you know, when you're back in the States next time, fly up to Toronto and to Canada and come and come and spend some time with me. So I did the next year, spend a day with him up there. And these are the things that happen as part of MDRT that also I'm a big believer in uh, things happen for a reason. The moons align, um, you know, doors of opportunity open, but you need to step through them. Um, and Tim introduced me to a concept called the past, the present, the future, which is a concept that we use as part of our discovery phase and understanding where people have come from, what's, what's conditioned them in their life, what are their biases towards money, uh, what are all the dynamics at play from a relationship point of view, how they behave, all of that. I think it's very important to observe all of that. Um, and then obviously understanding the future and then most importantly, sort of tapping into that future, the legacy. Well, let's um, thank you very much for that. And this leads me to um, changing gears and sort of getting a bit of a feel for you, you're now, um, you've formed quarter, quarter five, you've got a, a team here. It'd be great for our listeners to hear about sort of um, uh, the types of clients that quarter five uh, are, are currently um, looking after, um, how you do it, how big your team is, and, and there'd be some granularity, not just on the front end, but how you deliver the services. Um, because, you know, sometimes when you talk about a high net worth client and, and it's all very exciting and it, and it appears that there's big boardroom meetings and there's family offices, but geez, there's a lot of like, duck swimming in the background to make things happen, it'd be great to get a, a real feel for the client type and how you deliver on what you say. Mm. Yeah, there's a bit in that. So I'll, uh, I'll answer, please jump in with any, any uh, questions where you want me to sort of delve, delve a little bit more specifically. But um, I mean, the reason why we set up quarter five um, and, and as I guess set it up as a specialist business separate to Blue Rock was, um, was really identifying an opportunity in the market uh, where there, I mean, there are other businesses that play in this space uh, from a holistic advisory point of view, but not as many uh, because the space is dominated by the bigger investment managers and investment advisors, uh, which in part are our competition. Um, and you know, we have an investment committee and all the rest of it to be able to uh, to be able to compete on that front. Uh, but really, our point of differentiation, our value proposition, and what we're passionate about is working with those families in a holistic manner, um, really understanding past, present, the future, ultimately the legacy they, they want to leave for their for their kids through the intergenerational wealth transfer. Uh, family harmony is a is a massive driver of ultimately what um, what these families are striving to achieve. Um, so that gap in the market around really working with families and providing that holistic advisory service uh, is something that um that drove us to um you know make the big decision because we've got a lot of great friends in Blue Rock. It's been an amazing part of our journey. It's a great business. Uh, but we just felt like for for the next evolution of what we wanted to do was to set up a pure play specialist wealth business for family office. And looking at your website um, and, and fleshing out what you said, it, it appears that you you're very clever in swimming in, in the lane that you swim in, which is the human side, the getting the families right, getting the past, present, future right, and and um, you, you've assembled quite an impressive um, investment management committee. So that the other side of the ledger, which quite often is what everyone else leads with. You've got covered. Is that your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Like we 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 need to be able to, like I sit on um, investment committees for for some family offices and run our own investment committee. So I've been within that world for sort of long enough to understand what's needed um, to have the tickets to play, um, and what families um, are uh, are looking for in terms of the investment solutions. Uh, you do need to obviously look further afield than just the traditional markets into alternatives and uh, you know offshore these days is a lot more accessible. So, which which requires just a lot more due diligence. Yeah, it's not freely available, is it? I think like like most things. I mean, you you need to and you need to build it. And if yeah. you want to do it in a certain way, you, you and we're we're big builders. So I'll sort of link that back to sort of how we run the business in in a moment. But um, you know, it, we saw that. Um, I guess the lack of uh, due, due diligence frameworks and research available in those parts of the market is an opportunity to kind of build those services ourselves. And one of the things that we do for families now is actually help them implement their own due diligence process 
utilizing our own as a framework. That's pretty cool. Around how to run it and running, you know, digital questionnaires and scoring matrices, matrices and bringing the family together and make decisions. Um, and that would be quite a useful selling point when you're looking to potentially bring on a new family is, is give them, point them to the fact that, that you don't just tell them what to do, but sometimes you help build them sort of frameworks on how they can decide for themselves. Yeah, we've got this unique this unique opportunity where you're working with um, multiple multiple families and, and multiple clients. Where and this is the same for you know for, for anyone who's in wealth, but you get to see uh, how good businesses and good families and good operators function uh, and what best practice can look like, um, and then you can take the interpretation of all that. Um, and then um, provide a structured framework that you lead with as a business, but then you can also inject that uh, obviously into the operating businesses of families, which is which is a family office. And typically, you meet these families through their trusted accountants, or, or what's the way in which you get introduced to these families? A range of different, range of different. Um, Don't say Collingwood because yeah. that's no one's going to believe you. Or some people will, oh. but the other sixteen ends won't. No. Exactly. It's a lo- lo- I love hate affair with Collingwood and uh, and and all Collingwood supporters love it. So it's uh, water off a duck's back. Um, but um, no, it looks centers of influence. It's um, and other. I mean, not these families. Um, they they they're like minded people. They're typically you know um, they're friends and part of the community of other families. Um, there's professional groups that we're that we're part of. Um, you know, we've uh, we've sort of been well supported by organisations that. That look after that look after families and bring them together as part of a community. So we and my big philosophy, you know, in life has always been to add value. So if we get involved in the community, how do we add rather than you know putting up a sign and saying right we're here to grow our business and look for clients? It's like well, how do we get involved and actually add value? I'm a big believer in the network effect of, of connecting people and and adding value for them. So going out of my way to um, connect other professionals with each other, where I know that there's a benefit involved. For them, but not necessarily something explicitly involved for us. Um, and then ultimately, you know, I've, I've, you know, that's been a big part of how we've shown that we are interested, how we care, um, and that adding value is an important part of it. Uh, and then for the right people, that then just um, creates an ecosystem of yep. collaboration. Yep. Um, so, um, and part of, I guess, setting up quarter five has allowed us to go back out and build our strategic partnerships. Um, so, in the past, obviously, Blurex is a very diversified business with different professional services. So hard to have uh, external professional relationships where they cross over with other Blurex divisions. Yeah, look, I'll say it is. I mean, if you, you're pretty hard to go and organise relationships with other accounting firms yeah. when you you're involved in an accounting firm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. and it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's reality. That's the pro and con of being, as you know, that type of model. So that's exactly right. Now, um, I'm a big fan of the following term: be as, be inspirational to aspirational people and and the listenership of of this podcast are quite often people or are generally people in the industry um but maybe if you could put a few more commonly accepted bones around the type of clients so do your clients whether it be alternatives or whatnot typically invest that sort of 10 20 million dollars plus with you is that that sort of the mark a couple of things in there that would be good to stir would be good to highlight i guess the first one which is um which is a little bit different is that we don't require um for for a family to be a client of quarter five, we don't require them to invest anything through us, which is the first part of it. Now, it's very common that um, they do, and they can be five, 10, 20 plus million dollars of, of capital that we're looking after. And does your commercial um, engagement with them allow that? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, what we've, we've very um, specifically um, structured our service into the strategic consulting work that we do. Um, and you know we've we've built fee models that look at you know running gross profit at sixty percent margins to which is sort of where things should sit as a mature wealth business to make sure you're pricing things correctly sixty to seventy um, and then look at the time required to deliver that that consulting piece engaging with the family taking them through a discovery phase taking them through an, through an advisory phase implementing a whole range of projects because we're we are holistic in our approach and um, we're aiming to help families set up. You know, best practice structures, uh, things like succession planning and their corporate structure and family charters, investment policy frameworks, asset allocation frameworks, working with private bankers and property advisors and helping helping that facilitation role, financial modeling, looking at cash flow and liquidity, all of that. You know, none of that is funds under management linked. 
Um, so it's difficult to run an advisory model where traditionally you charge a certain percentage on, on funds and then you try to incorporate some of these other services. We made the decision to very separately um, or distinctly separate those two, charge for the consulting piece, charge a lower fee on the funds under management side because we're not trying to compensate ourselves on the other side. Yeah. Um, and then be able to go to market with both, with both, um, but also be comfortable to I- offer either or. And the way in which um, um, you've arranged the engagement, and ongoing management, is, is yourself quite often. And I imagine you're, you you have your fingers on most of the new clients as they come through or the new opportunities. But you've got, um, I'm reading website, you've got Ryan, who's state planner. So straight up, you're straight into it. You're talking about succession um, in the investments, John. And in, do you, in your team, who, who does who does all of the, the grinding work? Have you got a team of associates or, or how does that fit together? Yeah, good question. Um, so one of the things I learned early days. We're listening, by the way. Oh, Wayne, look, they make they make absolutely every, everything happen. I forgot, but, um, two of our, two of our best people heading overseas in a couple of weeks' time um, for all of December for a, for a wedding. So uh, I've said I may as, I may as well just go and join them because I'm not I'm not sure what I'm going to do for the next month without them without them helping me. But um, we can edit this out, Fira. <laughs> no, but- he likes to be vulnerable. There's a line, right? Uh, but it, but it, but in all seriousness, one of the things I learned early days in Blue Rock, which I've really tried to share with others, is to never go to a meeting uh, alone. And obviously now with the things like Read AI and other tools are making that a bit easier. Uh, but the concept of a wealth advisor going to a meeting, trying to engage properly, writing down notes, doing a diary note afterwards, sending a follow up, it's just it, it it's inefficient from our perspective. Having two sets of eyes and ears, having the quarterback of the client. Um, who then just runs with everything allows me and other senior advisors to um, to run a higher velocity client engagement process. So I'm going to jump in. You said quarterback, quarter five. Any lick? No, no. I thought it's just going to be the clever guy. I should have taken it. Yeah. So tell me, and, and just quick anecdote, and we'll get back to it. Where did quarter five come from? Yeah. So we um we got. Is that when Collingwood tries to win this year's or next year's uh, thing in the fifth quarter, or is that Tri- pretty late? Tries. Okay. Okay. You've heard it. I normally don't like to date these. But, uh, oh, um, you, you brought it up. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, no. So we had um, we had Andrew McKinnon from Taboo, um, a creative agency in Cremorne, um, helps with the process. So thanks, Macca, if uh, if you if you end up listening to this, um, and we went through a process of uh, it was a, it was a it was a great workshop actually, um, or multiple workshops where we sort of delved into. And Steve Glennon from Straight Back Private Equity helped us with it as well, but we dug into. What our core, what our core customer is, um, what our value proposition proposition is, what our uh, what our belief systems are, our own values, and all the rest of it. And um, so, out of that, we dug out some sort of keywords that really explained um, what ultimately we were trying to achieve through the business. And one of the words we were circling around was kindred, you know, that representation of sort of bringing family together and that in th- those relationships. We couldn't quite get there with the right name and trademarks. Uh, and then Andrew introduced the concept of the fifth quarter. You know what happens after the game? Yeah, what's the work that we do? First thing I thought of when when, yeah. when you uh, well, I reached out to you and and I've gone, oh, he's linking succession. Yeah. So clever. There's a few things really. So there is there is succession and legacy. What happens beyond life? What happens after we've had a meeting? What is the work that we do? Uh, what's the additional piece that we add to a family situation? That additional piece of value. And also the building that we're in is called Gate 8. Um, there's seven gates in the MCG. Uh, so this business is uh, buildings that have been affectionately called Gate 8. So quarter five kind of plays into that too. And I've been here, it is early morning, but uh, I've been past um, your coffee shop that has beer taps. So um, you, you went for the full-on um, authentic vibe. Well, I encourage you to come on a Friday afternoon, but it uh, didn't quite work out. No, I'm trying, to, I'm trying my best, everyone. So with the engine room, um, you bought uh, – you know, some of the team members that look at your website are actually for me and they've been with you for a while. And the current team obviously will get to a certain capacity, but in saying that, and you did mention um, AI that, that um, people are bringing into meetings in, in across all industries. Um, how long have you got until you get full? And, and what are you going to do about it? I mean, you, you also uh, are really looking for more partnerships. I mean, part of this statement piece around uh, liberating is a poor word, but you know, diversifying yourself as far as partnerships um, is is finding new ones. But but let's start with you know when when are you falling your current team and and what, what's technology going to do to help you? Mm. Yeah, there are there 
really important things for us to think about. I mean, we um we one of the uh, one of the great Dan Sullivan tools is uh, a tool called the Ten Times Mind Expander, uh, which is where you think about decision making for your business with a ten times mindset. So, what would your business need to look like if it was ten times the size of what it is today? Um, so, we did a little bit of a session around that earlier in the year and said, right, well, for our business to be ten times the size or actually a little bit more than that, then what sort of revenue does that look like? What are the what's the advice team look like? How does that feel in terms of size, in terms of our ability to maintain quality and culture? Um, and where we got to was that, you know, we'd be comfortable growing this business to, you know, sort of a 25 to 30 to 35 person practice. Uh, and then obviously you continue to reassess these things along the way. It's about halfway there at the moment. Is that right? We've got nine in Melbourne. Yeah, we've got two and we've got two offshore. Yep. Um, so, and we have, we have, and this was one of the other things that I sort of learned out of the Blue Rock journey, the build it and they will come methodology. Um, and it is something that uh, I think wealth advisors in general, um, they do poorly, uh, which is hiring ahead of need. Often businesses wait for we're full, we're over capacity and make that decision to go and hire someone. Oh, you're talking to a guy who spent a bit of time at uh, a business you know of called VBP and the amount of phone calls I go, okay, well, when will this need come up? And they're like, well, actually three months ago they left. Yeah. You're like, thank you, yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, it was... Um, w- the organic growth that we had within Blurrock Private Wealth and Blurrock in general was really on the basis of hiring and finding and growing. Do you reckon, do you reckon that on that comment, do you reckon a lot of people who run financial planners, practices, are great financial planners, but possibly didn't spend enough time in the business part of their course? You know, everyone looks back and goes, you need to build a capacity cut. You've got to look at GP. You've got to look at that. But sometimes I think because it's so in- intoxicating working with the client and that relationship, but I just think they park that part of their, their – and it's the reason why I've, I've got the engine room out is, is to, to basically say, well, either lean into it or get yourself a general manager or a CFO and, and trust. Yeah. No, which, sure. which one are you doing? Uh, well, I mean, my philosophy is, has been shared leadership, um, and I think it's important to recognize what you're good at, what you're passionate about, and, and how best to deploy yourself within the business rather than thinking about yourself as the business. Um, so, And, of course, in and on. Our philosophy has been around um, sharing leadership across. Um, there's, so there's four of us that basically lead and run uh, the quarter five business, um, and those four people um, have different skill sets across the finance function, the technology function, risk and compliance, the client journey. Um, so that allows me to spend 70 or 80 percent of my time on the client side and involved in the business at a very strategic level, um, but. I don't have to spend a lot of time on the nuts and bolts of building because we've got those other skill sets in the business that are focused on doing that and they're extremely good at that. Are they all shareholders? They're incoming shareholders, yes. So yeah. So um, you've got the four four pillars, I suppose. And, and what's the cadence of them? Like when do they get together and what authority do you, do you bequest upon them? Because it's all good and well to have names on websites, but sort of how often do they meet and how does it work? Yeah, good question. So we they catch up weekly, um, and then we have a we have a fortnightly um, check in that I'm typically involved in. Um, but it's really just to just to sort of for all of us to get across the different things that we've all been working on, because we have different responsibilities around the business evolution and innovation. But ultimately, you know, having those people in the business where you um, trust their capacity to deliver a level of work which is over and above what you could deliver yourself, I think is is liberating. Uh, being able to hand the reins over on certain things um, and let people run and grow themselves. I'll actually read off your website, quote, unquote. At quarter five, we believe that exceptional wealth management is built on trust, expertise, and collaboration. So you've just lived your brand promise. Mm. Yeah, it's a big one. Thank you. Um, yeah, and look, it's that's not they are, and they are obviously words on the website, but that's it's it's what we you know really believe in, and I get a massive kick out of. You know, um, seeing um, seeing people do great things and develop themselves, and uh, and I think it's a big part of why we why we have been on the journey together with quite a few people for um, for extended periods of time because we sort of recognise that everyone's on their own has their own journey in life, um, and that it's obviously not all about career. There's it's more about ultimately the way you live your life and what you want to achieve, um, and your career should be um, complementary to that. Um, so we spend a lot of time with with our team talking about. We do our you know our typical performance review process every six months, but every other six months we actually sit down and um, and go through personal goals and a personal planning framework. 
awesome because I'm always in this um, podcast ask three questions. Why do people join you? Mm. Why do they stay? And how do they grow? And I'm adding another one for you, which is, um, are you a wedding crasher for every um, employee or is this, is this a new thing? Uh, no, I've been to a few few weddings over the journey. Um, I feel so very privileged. Um, so, you know, this one's over, the, the one that's coming up is overseas on the 20th of December. Oh, shit. I hope it's an awesome wedding. Uh, absolutely. Yep. 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 So, but, but why do people join? Why, why do they stay and how do they grow? And I think you may have touched on the grow bit already, but I'll let you answer it. Yeah, I think the the why do they why do they come in the first place um, is a I mean we attract like minded people who have a who have a thirst um, for excellence and mastery is one of our values. How do we come become? We don't need to be the best because I think that that can be perceived as being e- egotistical. But the search for excellence and wanting to be the best versions of ourselves, uh, personally and professionally, is I think a part of what attracts people who want that from their careers. Um, and I mean, the business that we're building, you know, we feel like we've got a great advisory proposition now for the families who we work with, but we also know that there's so much more that we can do and how much further we can grow uh, through the use of technology that you touched on before and other things. Um, Keep going, and I'm going to ask you text stack in a sec. Yeah, so you know, why do, why do people come? I think it's it's that it's that thirst for excellence and 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 career growth and, and being the best versions of their, of themselves. Why do they stay? I think that we we work within a very uh, fast paced environment um, where um, we're not a we're not a mature business like we're a growth business and we're doing a lot of things all at the same time. So workload um, workload's pretty intense. Um, but at the same time, we're riding the bumps uh, and we're celebrating the wins together, uh, and ultimately we're all, we're all growing together. Um, so, you know, I think it con- continues to go back to how do how do I keep thinking about how do we as a leadership team keep thinking about what everyone is, uh, what does their next step look like, what what's their view of that, what's our view of that, how do we keep facilitating what what how that plays out for them? And and you 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 meet you did mention you review them. Um, uh, once a year, yeah, um, their three sixty review, whatever the terminology, and and I picked up earlier that you um, uh, you're facilitating some sort of ESOP or or, or a share in the ownership of the game at the moment. Is that right? Yeah. So a couple of things on that. We do. We basically in a formal manner we catch up quarterly. Um. So and it, uh, December and June is when we do our you know performance review from more from a professional point of view, and then the other quarters. The first one we do is an offsite where we an offsite planning team planning session but as part of doing that we spend a few hours on a personal planning matrix that we built that has you know goals and education and family and what does culture mean to everyone and all the rest of it um and then we catch up on that um sort of later in the year as well just to check in on how people are going throughout their own year on their own personal planning it's like your team's mini family office plan yeah yeah i mean it's trying just trying to live the trying to not be the plumber with the leaky tap now i didn't we didn't didn't talk about this question earlier but i'll ask you so are you all there reviewing everyone else your board structure? Have you got investors? Who reviews you? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Good point. Um, we have toyed. We haven't set it up yet. We've got a board, absolutely, uh, which is the the four people who or five people who are the leadership team of quarter five. Um, we're very very transparent from a with all information within the business, not just at a board level, but across the whole team. So, but what does that mean? Does that mean that you don't just share goals, but you share where you're at financially, potentially, those sort of things? Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. So everyone sees the whole team sees all the financials every every month, yep. uh, and we, we talk through that really. Open. I'm a big believer in that. Um, it's a, a thing that Dave Carney bought in at VBP, which is the great game of business, where uh, it just transparent. It just it just it, it it means your energy's focused on the right things. You don't have to you know try and explain different things. It's just there. It's a it's yeah. It's a, and it's a concept as of the entrepreneur as well. So having those who are in the business who may not be business owners and may not have a desire to be a business owner, but Will act and behave like they are um, owners of a business. I'm googling entrepreneur right now. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it'll come up. It, it will. It will. That's uh, you'll actually just picture of you. Yeah. So, so, and then what's it look like? I mean, you, you um, the the Blue Rock um, business. You were there for years, and it was a, bi- a big business, and they they knew how to had fun. Um, what's it look like when you guys succeed? Like, what 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 do you do with the the team? Because they're all in the office at the moment. So is that right? So you've got an in-office philosophy, is that right? We Look, we've got an in-office preference. Preference. Um, because we, like in terms of where we are, like the actual premises itself. I've come here. 
Yeah, yeah, which is, um, you know, we, we want people to be collaborating. Yeah. You know, the energy, bringing that energy together. And the nature um, of the type of business you do is a collaboration business. You know, you've got yeah. multiple people working for one solution or one client. And we're also part of a part of a community here as well. Like, um, what so, does that mean? Well, it's a, a community and an ecosystem that um, has ultimately been um, always the vision and has been um, implemented by the Harris family, um, who uh, um, have been a, a part of our journey as well, that we're very thankful for. Um, so, you know, when Brad um, sort of took over as CEO of the family office, his one of his um, elements of his vision was to actually have a physical home, a, an office for the family office, right, and to build an ecosystem that represented the family's brand and values. Um, and that's really, you know, um, where Gate Eight is, has how come how Gate Eight has come about. Um, so we see ourselves as an important part of that community and, and we also want to make sure that we give back to that community. So physically being around and getting involved in events and bouncing ideas and sharing opportunities is, is sort of a big part of, um, is a big part of being part of physical part of that community. Positive ecosystem all around. Yeah. Yeah. But look, having said that, I mean, some people are great working remotely and I think COVID, you know, taught us that. Um, other people, it doesn't come naturally to them. Uh, like they need the structure and discipline of an office. Um, so, you know, for those that are naturally good at working remotely, then by all means, it's, um, you know, it's one of the things that I enjoy doing is not having to think about what other people are doing, uh, because they just, you just know that they're, um, they're doing great, great things. Uh, so for those type of pe- types of people, they can sort of flow in, flow out however they like. Now, um, given that, uh, our listenership, we've got about, you know, 10, 10% of, of our practices, um, either are all in in that you know, high net worth, or, or they have some high net worth clients, and um, and they're all operating off a, a rich tapestry of sometimes efficient, sometimes inefficient tech stack. Um, how do you bring it all together for your team? Yeah, it's um, so there's a couple of things I'd I'd share on that. One is um, I guess before technology, it's around thinking about client process. Um, so um, how do we? So we're big on thinking about consistent client experience and process, and then how do you how do we use technology to help enable that? Um, well, we have to be consistent because all their other consumer things they use are pretty good. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I, I actually said Google it a second ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah there yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but I mean, our industry it's, it's obviously got a lot better in the last sort of ten to fifteen years. But um, yeah, it's certainly been guilty of um, sort of turning up to a meeting with a with a pad and pad and paper, uh, pad and pen and having a conversation and not really following a structured process. And when we're doing what we do, which involves so many moving parts, uh, we need to we need to provide structure, particularly as we grow, so that as we grow that advisory team, families are coming to see quarter five and and getting the same the same magic that's been well thought through. And probably the thing that really ran that home was doing the Bill Backrack course where it was like this script this whole week was just focused on this this scripted client engagement. Yep. Which was setting the advisor up and the client up for success. So we run um, we run a discovery phase, which is where we sort of really unpack the client's world. And, and at what stage does technology led with that? Do you what, what are you using up front? Yeah, so Cognito Forms is a big part of what of what we use. So we've built a what we call a series of workshops um, using Cognito that starts with very early days client engagement, but you know things like um, you know building uh, understanding someone's investment philosophy and then drafting uh, drafting an actual document drafting a family charter building out the client's estate um, estate plan understanding all of their goals uh, and objectives um, we you know Cognito is a great tool for kind of setting up a client journey capturing information but also educating the client on the on the way through yeah so that's a part of it um, we use other tools obviously like you know uh, like a HubSpot uh, as a pretty important sort of front end CRM, we use Xplan, um, but primarily for its modeling um, and for its um, whole of wealth reporting capability, which, which is one of the services that we provide to clients report on every asset in their whole financial position. And financial modeling was right back at the beginning one of the things you're passionate about. Yeah, and we still do it. Like it's um, even for families that are worth you know tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions. Like there's still this this one of the objectives that often sits within a family is what net wealth they leave as part of their legacy. Um, and in order to help understand that, you can actually visualize that by mapping it out. Yep. So you're not doing financial modeling to work out whether they can pay the mortgage off or pay for the school fees, but it still has a, quite a purpose and scenario analysis. Like it, it, it goes right back to what you said. It's a, it's a tool at the core of what we do. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So um, uh, you've got uh, Cognito at the front end, which is the, the tailored one, and then um, uh, explain which is so uh, I suppose 
quite quite consistent, especially in modeling across the entire industry. Um, if I was to talk about partnerships, um, I would assume that everyone's lining up to be a partner of of, of yourself and your business. What, what what attributes or what qualities are you looking in in, um, in leadership and the actual partnerships? Cultural alignment, first and foremost, like uh, like with the, the other businesses that we are going to um, spend time with and work with and entrust with our client relationships as well. Are they aligned with us in terms of how we think about um, think about professional services and looking after someone, how we interact as our teams. Yep. Um, so that first and foremost, building that relationship, which, uh, which is where it all starts. And then the capability, obviously, are they, are those, uh, partners playing in our yes, and it, same field? And again, you, you, you were very big on technical proficiency. So, um, you know, it's no accident. As you said, you spend more time at uni after school than at school. So you need technical proficiency. Yeah. Cultural alignment. Yeah. Um, uh, anything else? And also just what does it, what does, I mean, we're in business, we're in, we're, we're growing. So, um, also to start identifying what the commercial opportunity yeah. looks like. So a symbiotic relationship. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Well, and, and, um, you mentioned, um, off, off air, um, that you were looking at the moment. So if people are listening out there, uh, you're clearly a big believer in, in being a specialist in what you do. And then, then out, 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 outsourcing is a poor name, but you know, partnerships. Partnerships. Yeah. Um, and uh, I always like to ask um, business leaders um, here what they think the future of an advice practice is. So obviously you're going to put your hat on for the one that you lead, but maybe give us a bit of insight what, where you think other types of advice practices sit and what their opportunities are. Through that one, I hear. Yeah, well, look, I mean, it's it's pretty clear. I think the standard answer would be that obviously technology is going to and AI is going to continue to um, continue to disrupt the 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 more traditional role in some sense. It's only been a standard answer for about two years, by the way. Before then, it wasn't. Yeah, well, so you're right. Yeah, and it, look, I mean, it's 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 slowly happening. I think um, these things have the capacity to accelerate pretty quickly as well. So. Um, and obviously, there's going to be a part of the industry where there's an older demographic which um, sort of probably won't ever engage with those tools. So we're probably right with it within a certain part of the client segment for a period of time. Um, but if we just sort of um, if we just sort of bank on that and not think about what the opportunity looks like going forward, it's less about managing risk but more about opportunity. Then what's the role of the advisor? What what role do they play? And yeah, I mean, again. You, you'd, you'd expect that the typical answers around sort of emotional intelligence, family dynamics, taking people on the journey, connecting the dots. It's a big part of what we do is helping connect the dots across legal, finance, accounting, wealth, investments, or whatever it might be, being that person in the middle who can help orchestrate it. Because most families who have wealth, uh, they don't have experience in connecting all those dots and understand the legal piece and the accounting piece and all the rest of it to a sufficient level to be able to do it themselves. Um, Especially so, ones that made their wealth out of being hyper focused and hyper good at a narrow range of things, for sure. And, and yeah. they're brilliant at certain things. And, yeah. and um, uh, I suppose it's great that they're engaging with acknowledging that there's there's a broader world. But um, yeah. you mentioned that uh, that AI and, and, and efficiency is going to be a big part of it. But uh, given you, yourself and Ella, from a personal perspective, you've got three kids under the age of eight. Then you've got another. You've got quite a few years left in you doing this, mate. I can tell you that much for free. Unless they're going to start giving away private schools fees for nothing. Yeah, you, you've got it. You've got a, quite a few years of doing this. Yeah, well, we, we can't get ChatGPT to look after the kids, so we'll uh, get ChatGPT to help us with the business. There you go. That's exactly right. Um, there's there's his ethical uh, <laughs> standpoint on that one. And you mentioned it. I asked you, you know, and as I asked a lot of people, what's, um, you know, a lot of people listen to this in the industry, and what's the number one thing, the first thing you'd like to people to leave um, this podcast. And you said that you, you're a big fan of giving back and that you don't want anything other than to give and impart knowledge that other people can, um, can benefit from. Mm. With that statement in mind, what would you like to see more of and, and, and how do you think Ensemble fits in? Well, I think Ensemble plays a, plays a massive role in bringing that community together um, and making sure that the, uh, the quality of collaboration remains high um so i think that's you know part of the challenges as as you know sort of networks grow then um and and you see that within businesses as well as they get to a bigger a bigger size uh, and i think it's part of what really attracts me to still being a, a, a solid part of the mdrt is that 
it attracts a certain type of person who really wants to be there, wants to give back and maintain maintain that quality. Um, so you know, there's um, there's there's more of that that I'd like to see. More people getting involved who have the capacity to to add value, um, and you know, the the role of ensemble to help bring those people together and focus on best practice evolution, which I think is a big part of you know why you guys do what you do. Um, is you know is the positive evolution of financial advice is the catch cry. So there you go. Well, you're too, pretty close. Wasn't too far off. No, you're very good. So um, yeah. So they're, they're the things that I personally believe in, and also you know we're all you know we're all um have lots of things going on, uh, but there's also always opportunities to you know catch up for a coffee with someone or um, get involved in a mentoring program or whatever it might be. Um, so you know they're all the things that help. You know, like the conversation I had with Scott when I was 16, that sort of sent me on the direction of financial advice and, you know, I'm eternally grateful for it. It was only last week I was talking with some um, people in another industry, in the mortgage industry, and and I came up with this sort of thought that people, um, just because you want to be self-employed doesn't mean you want to work by yourself. Mm. And I think that that gets lost in translation. And given we're in an environment where there are far more people wanting the goods and services that we provide them, there are quality and trained goods and service providers, then the more giving and the higher the bar, the better it is for everyone. Absolutely. And, and um, the, this, this interview has been fantastic. Quarter five looks like, uh, you know, it's, it's not the beginning of the end. It's the end of the beginning, I think, is the, the terminology as far as what you're looking to try and craft um, out there. If uh, you're listening to this and you, you like what you hear, there's plenty of links. You can follow the links there. Um, Adam was very reluctant in asking for anything, um, but uh, just because of that, I'm probably going to throw a bunch of links and a bunch of things in there for people if they're interested in what he does in either becoming a partner or or, or anything further. But on behalf of Ensemble and myself in the engine room, um, I'd like to thank you very much for spending the time today and being part of the engine room podcast. Cheers, Adam. Thanks, Roxy and the Ensemble team and uh, for everyone who's uh, listened. Thanks very much. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Cheers.